And this particular Rebetzin, uh, who my wife admired, she was probably 50 years old, maybe my wife was 24, 25, and um, she came and she visited and she said to, to, to Malki that, you know, Malki, it's not fair that you want to keep this child at home. You can't put a, a glass on the table. You can't put a vase out. It's a life in plastic. It's, it's an extraordinary limited life where you're running after him and just watching your other young children from him and, and with him, etc. And it's not fair to your husband. And you have to think about taking this child out of the family setting. And Malki said to her, she says, Rabbits, and you know how much I admire you and how much I appreciate you. But you do realize that you have a serious problem. She looks at Malki and says, like, like, what is that? She says, you don't believe in God. Welcome back to another very special episode of Inspiration for the Nation. You'll hear more in this episode how I got to Rabbi Kalman Samuels, a lot to do with one of my favorite Instagram accounts, favorite LinkedIn accounts, Twitter accounts, they're everywhere, Humans of Judaism. You'll hear more about that later. But how many times in our lives do we have a struggle, a roadblock, something just stopping us from getting to our full potential? How many times do we use that roadblock as the foundation for our roadmap to build our lives? Well, that's what Rebitson uh, Samuels did, and you'll hear a lot about her. I, I really should have had both of them on this podcast and even ask uh, Rabbi Kalman Samuels for uh, his wife also to be here, and he said that she has never appeared on anything, so chances of getting her was 0% chance. But they together started one of the most powerful foundation organizations, movements, uh, centers in the world, the biggest in Israel. And um, it, it's it's incredible. Their son is is uh, has been called the Helen Keller of Israel. You'll understand and you'll hear why. And um, this is a beautiful story of never giving up hope and I got chills so many times. This episode is in memory of Shimon David Ben Yaakov Shleima. It is in memory of Miriam Sarah Bas Yaakov Moshe. It is, and it is in memory of Simcha Beryl David Ben Avram Moshe. This episode is powered by the Unrestricted Podcast, the wonderful, incredible Simcha Time, and Encore LBA, which you will hear so much about because they're incredible and you can get involved in what they're doing. Now, my conversation with Rabbi Kalman. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Here we are with Rabbi Kalman Samuels, but when I spoke to you on the phone, you're like, for you, no, call me Kalman, which, I don't know, I found it a little strange because you look like so much like Rabbi Kalman to me. It is Rabbi Kalman. Uh, I am not working in the rabbi field. I uh, am doing a lot of things with kids with disabilities, and I'm very close to everybody who I work with, and I always, you know, go by Kalman, and someone calls me rabbi, that's fine, but I just enjoy the intimacy of Kalman. Okay, I like that. But you weren't always Kalman. No, as a matter of fact, I'm still not. On my passport, it's still K-E-R-R-Y, Kerry okay. Samuels. Uh, I, you know, things change sometimes. Uh, I wasn't born in a from community. I was born in Vancouver, Canada, uh, 1951, 71 years old, and uh, we were a traditional family somewhat. We kept semblance of kosher at home, but there was no kosher restaurants outside, and uh, we ate outside wherever we ate. And, uh, you know, my father would make kiddush on Friday night, make a motzi, but the television would go on afterwards, and uh, our style of life was totally, you know, non, non-religious in terms of... Uh, so, like, traditional... Yeah, we would go to we would go to synagogue on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur several times in the course of the year. I went to Sunday school at an Orthodox uh, congregation till I was fifteen, three times a week. So I was initiated and had knowledge of some kind. But to say it was a depth of knowledge, no, we were very Jewish. We mm -hmm. were simply not, uh, you know, Orthodox. When did your Orthodox journey begin? Uh, well, we just started a little bit earlier okay, before sure. that. Uh, growing up. I grew up in a community of a beautiful community of 25,000 Jews amongst probably seven, 800,000 people in the general community in Vancouver. And Vancouver happens to be probably the most beautiful city in North America. It's pinned between the, the mountains and the Pacific Ocean. And it's just, you know, blessed in the most amazing ways with parks and greenery, et cetera. 
So I grew up in uh, public schools and uh, was had a lot going for me when I graduated from high school. I had the academic scholarships. I had a basketball scholarship to university and um, spent one year in the local university, University of British Columbia, studying math and philosophy and other things. And for my second year, I was on my way to France to study and become what I'd hoped would be a professor of Western civilization. I was an academic. And um, my mother asked me en route to France in 1970 to um, stop for two weeks in Israel. And, you know, just see the country. They'd been there a number of times. And I did that. And Israel being Israel, it arouses in people a great deal of feelings, I think, especially the first time. And I realized very quickly there's much more here than I could have imagined. You know, I went to a kibbutz, I slept on the beach in Eilat. You speak to an enormous number of people. And one of the people who I met was a rabbi, the likes of which I hadn't seen in Vancouver. You know, the Orthodox rabbi did not have a big beard. He didn't have, uh, you know, a hat on, what have you. And uh, we got into a fascinating discussion with this man, and he uh, spoke in a perfect Australian English, and even that floored me. Like, how could this fellow looking like this speak English? I mean, hmm. you know, I just wasn't, hadn't seen this before. And uh, we spoke, and he asked what I'm doing, and I told him I'm off to France in two days to, you know, further my education and study. What are you going to do? And I told him, I'm going to study, you know, Western civilization, Western culture. And he said, why in the world are you going to France to study someone else's culture when you really don't know your own? So I argued that I know, and he showed me very quickly that I don't. <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, I have a great program. This was 1970, before the yeshivot like Eisha Torah and Or Semer were realities. Uh, he had a, gr a great group for six weeks, a program where guys from Ivy League universities were going to be studying there. And they're a bit older than me, but I would enjoy them. And I could s study for six weeks and get a real handle and then move on. It was a very difficult decision for me, but I said, you know what? He's right. Okay. So I did it. And after six weeks, I realized that, hey, I'm going to take the summer. So I went till the end of the summer. And at the end of the summer, I went elsewhere. And uh, I studied in a place called Hartman College with a very dynamic young rabbi, 29-year-old by the name of Rabbi Chaim Bravender. And uh, he was a YU product and just a very extraordinary man. And uh, he had a, around him some wonderful, you know, young people who were studying very seriously. And uh, I did that and uh, studied for another year. And at that point, I had to decide, do I go back to college and take my scholarships or do I continue? And to my father's chagrin, I decided that I'm going to leave the scholarships and I'm going to continue studying. And at some point I decided, you know, if I was in India, I wouldn't be hanging out with a bunch of English speakers. I would go see the real ashram. So I said, where am I going to find the real ashram here? The Jewish ashram. And I said, you know what? I took a college textbook in Yiddish and I studied for a month and learned good Yiddish. And my grandparents spoke Yiddish. They were immigrants from 100 years ago. So they spoke English, of course, but Yiddish was still a very much their language. I heard it all the time, but didn't speak it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I enrolled myself in a yeshiva called Chug Chasam Seifer, which was a Hungarian Hasidic yeshiva with very Litvish learning in Bnei Brak. And they had never seen anyone like me before. And uh, the chief rabbi, Rabbi Unger, Zechat Tzadik Nivracha, said, if you want to come, you're welcome. He tested me. And I did, and I absolutely loved it. And I got immersed in, over my head in, you know, 24 seven. And uh, at the age of 21, I was introduced to a nice young lady and uh, I got married to her sometime later. And I mean, some months later, and uh, my dear wife, Malki and I began our life in Yushalayim and I started learning in Koilin and, uh, studied actually from the very beginning, I was determined not just to study anything I wanted to study for, uh, you know, smicha and hora'a, and I did that, and the studies were in Yiddish, in a very excellent place, and uh, some years later, I guess four or five years later, I was uh, we received smicha, and I thought that I would go on possibly to be in the area of, you know, towards Poisek, these kinds of things. Not, I wasn't going to be a communal rabbi per se. And uh, at that time, 
my wife took our second child, Yossi, to a public health center where everybody received their vaccinations. This was 1977. Unbeknown to the public in Israel, the Ministry of Health was having severe problems with several batches of what's called DPT vex vaccine, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus. And uh, for whatever reason, they did not stop it in the bud. And it went on from June till December. Hundreds of children were injured. We don't know how many died. <clears throat> My son was injured as well. And he immediately had a severe reaction. And he became blind, deaf, and very hyperactive. So our young lives were suddenly flipped on their heads. Totally shifted. It, it became a 24-7 enterprise. You know, you really didn't have anything else. You just were caring for this child, looking for medical help, looking to see what could possibly be done. And uh, because it was a, you know, basically on a government level, it was a absolute horrific things that they did. They also somehow made sure the doctors weren't talking about it. Yeah. So we couldn't even get proper medical information. And my uncle, my father's younger brother, was the head of orthopedics in New York at uh, Maimonides Hospital, Dr. Herschel Samuels. And he said to us, come out to New York and I'll put you in contact with doctors who will see the child and tell you exactly what they think. So we thought we were coming out for three weeks. We did. And we learned very quickly. We saw the first neuro-ophthalmologist that he put us in contact with. And he did the exact same tests that the doctors in Israel did. But he said to us, I'm sorry to break the news to you, but your son's optic nerve is atrophied, which means it's pale. He will never see. And of course, that was like a finality. We we knew we had a lot of problems. His his eye his eyes his eyeballs were moving it around all the time, yeah. but we didn't know that it was going to be you know blindness. Uh, and he and another doctor said there seems to be a problem with the development of his hearing, and you know a year and a half two years later he was told, he was deaf, deaf, and uh, so we stayed here in New York. We enrolled him probably the best school for the blind at that time here in New York called the Lighthouse, which was on 59th and Lexington in, Man in Manhattan. We lived in Flatbush, we lived in Borough Park, and I uh, took a four-month course through a Jewish organization via NYU uh, that enabled one to get into the computer field. And I got into the computer field and did very well, and I was able to provide a very nice income for the family, working for very large corporations here in the States. And uh, we did the best we could for our son. From time to time, my wife had visitors from Israel. You know, former teachers, a, a very, very significant Rebetzin that came to visit. And this particular Rebetzin, uh, who my wife admired, she was probably 50 years old, maybe my wife was 24, 25. And um, she came and she visited and she said to, to Malki that, you know, Malki, it's not fair that you want to keep this child at home. You can't put a, a glass on the table. You can't put a vase out. It's a life in plastic. It's, it's an extraordinary limited life where you're running after him and just watching your other young children from him and, and with him, etc. And it's not fair to your husband. And you have to think about taking this child out of the family setting. And Malki said to her, she says, Rabbits, and you know how much I admire you and how much I appreciate you. But you do realize that you have a serious problem. She looks at Malki and says, like, like, what is that? She says, you don't believe in God. And there was silence. And Malki said, what exactly are you telling me? Everything is from God. Everything is, is Ashkocha Protis. Everything God looks, divine providence. But when it comes, something comes up that's not convenient, oh no, this one we'll take out of the house, and then we'll go on accepting everything from God. She says, Rebbe, this is also from God, and it's a gift from him to me, and I will never take him out of my house, and I will do everything I can for him as long as I live. So that night, she cried, and she said, God, I am never taking Yossi out of the house, but if you ever decide to help my Yossi, I'm gonna dedicate my life to helping other mothers with their children with disabilities. I don't think she used exactly that language, but that's what she said. And fast forward, we were back in Israel. Uh, I was working in the computer field, six children. Yossi was now eight. And in the deaf school in Jerusalem where we lived, a deaf teacher in the deaf school put one of his palms on the table. And he looked like a little five-year-old, you know, didn't hear, didn't see, looking in space. 
And in the other poem, she spelled five symbols. A shin, a vav, a lamed, a chet, nun, with symbols that are used for the deaf. And of course, she couldn't put it in front of his face because he wouldn't see it. So she did it in the palm of his hand. And at some point after days of this, he smiled from ear to ear. And she had the smarts, I must say, the good sense to realize, as she said, he just had his Helen Keller moment. He just made the connection to communication where one recognizes that the object you're touching has a name. And she taught him the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And we learned very quickly how to spell those same letters. It's quite simple. And uh, we began to communicate for the first time wow. with our son. Another amazing young speech therapist in the deaf school, after you know about a year of this, said, I'm now going to teach him how to speak Hebrew. So again, this was like mission impossible. And we looked at her and said, really? <laughs> you know, the key, how are you going to penetrate someone who can't hear and can't see? Hold on, before, before that, did you, <clears throat> did you think he was even capable of communicating or you just didn't know because he was in his own world? And he was totally, totally a dynamic kid. There was not, I mean, he was not your little kid sitting in the corner. Mm. Yossi was part of our family from beginning to end. He was a dynamic kid. He was number, you know, uh, two in the family and he had four younger brothers. And Malki and I made a decision early on that we weren't going to play around and we're going to have our children when God gives them to us. We did want a family and we had six children in the scope of seven years. Wow. And uh, so Yossi had four younger brothers very close in age. And, you know, they grew up together. And Yossi was a kid that rode a tricycle, bumped into whatever he bumped into. He, you know, he went, like the kids rode tricycles, he rode a tricycle. He also had awkward movements. He walked and, you know, we could uh, walk with him, but you always had to sort of just guide him a drop, hold on, just to give him that little sense of you're there. And we could go, you know, as far as you want with him. But, you know, there was nothing he was ever afraid of, and there was nothing he wasn't a part of. And he understood everything, even though he couldn't express it. Um, so when he did get communication, you know, we learned just how much he knew of everything that was going on around him and unable to express it. Um, so she succeeded. And uh, in two years time, he, she put her hands initially, to, you know, she, in his, in around his neck and in his mouth, and he bit her hands because he didn't know what she wanted. And ultimately she taught him how to speak Hebrew. So, you know, it was synthetic, it was with an accent, but once you got the accent, you got it. And for example, the word, let us say the word ima in Hebrew. So you have a consonant and you have a vowel, unlike English. I mean, you have vowels in English, but not like in Hebrew under the letter. So it would be for him, everything synthetic, Ima was a e m a a And over six months, he would learn to put that together, yachad, and he would learn to say Ima. And similarly with every word, it was very, you know, deliberate. And he slowly learned to speak Hebrew without that, those breaks in the letters. And uh, he was off to the races, and he turned out to be more than brilliant. And it was just a matter of every th a deep thirst for another word, another. And we, we learned that he learned nouns, he learned verbs, he learned adjectives. And then he learned, you know, things that were abstract that he could never have touched and he could never have seen. Uh, but he understood them. It was, it was extraordinary. They taught him, for example, uh, dates and then the calendar. And then they taught him the Hebrew calendar. So someone said, you're crazy. It's enough that he knows the English calendar. <laughs> he learned the Hebrew calendar and he just learned it very quickly. And he actually knew he could tell you two weeks from now what the Hebrew date would be uh, or what the English date would be. And he just had it all together in a sense that till today, it's like really sort of, a, no one quite understands. And, but he, he has a lot of these kinds of things. So at that time, Malki sat me down and said to me, it's payback time. I made a promise, God delivered. I know exactly what I want to do to help other mothers and I need your help. And it took us time because I didn't have any money. And I began looking for someone who might want to help her get it moving because in order to do it, we had to at least rent a small apartment of some kind. And uh, she wanted to do an after school program that I'll describe. And um, it took five years till, you know, 
someone actually helped us to get started. And what happened was my father was very ill suddenly in Vancouver and I flew out to see him. He was undergoing surgery and um, I met in synagogue there somebody who I knew the family, <clears throat> a very wealthy family in Vancouver and they had just lost their, their mother and uh, the wife of the older fellow and uh, the Diamond family. And uh, so I saw him every day in the morning when I went to pray in the morning and, and later in the afternoon. And we fell into talking a lot. It was, you know, common ground. He had lost a mother and I was there for my father who was very ill. And uh, the day before I left, after a week, my father was, did well. Uh, I spoke to my wife and I said to her, you know, Gordon has become very friendly. Should I, you know, should I ask him? She says, what's he going to do? Give you a patch? <laughs> Just ask him. So, uh, before I left on that program, I had written down the dream so I could share it with people and with Malki years earlier. And the dream was written on like a little over two and a half pages, what we wanted to do. And we didn't, you know, what everything we wanted to do. And I saw Gordon in the morning and I said, Gordon, you know, I know you're always approached by people, but I have a, my wife has a dream. And I'd love you to just read this and come back in the afternoon and tell me what you think. So he came back in the afternoon. He says, look, it's a bottomless pit. You're going to keep coming to me. And I just can't get involved with anything like this. So we spoke at it, a long story. But at, at the end, he told me the next day, you know, I spoke to my wife. We're going to get you started. We're going to give you $50,000. Tell your wife to go rent a little apartment, hire a couple of people, and good luck to you. So we did that. We went back and, you know, great excitement. And uh, we had to give it a name. And uh, we gave it a name, Shalva, S-H-A-L-V-A. It's a word that is mentioned once in the entire Tanakh. It's, it's in Psalms 122, verse 7, Yehi shalom bechelech, shalva ba'amunoisayich. May there be peace in your walls, shalva in your palaces. And shalva means peace of mind or serenity. And what we wanted to give these people was out of the chaos of having a child that they were, weren't expecting and trying to get their lives together, we wanted to be able to help them with quality of life. So we got busy and we rented a duplex, a garden duplex, hired two staff and Malki ran it. And it was a bridge between what the government provided with special ed education to, you know, going home in the evening. So we had young children who arrived at one, at two, at three, three thirty, even four, and they would stay until six to get a hot meal. And Malki would then bus them home to, you know, wherever they lived. Initially it was in the, in the vicinity and it was a game changer because all of a sudden a parent, instead of having to rush or home from work or be prepared for the child to come home, let's say at three o'clock, they could take a full-time job. Both parents could work. The siblings could come home and do homework with mommy and daddy without a, without someone always being not in the way, but having a priority that his needs had to be met. And it, people began banging my door down. This is 1990. So there weren't cell phones yet, but people knew the address and they were phoning, banging my son, my nephew, my, my neighbor's son, you know, a child or a girl, it, need help the family's falling apart and you know we took them in and it began to grow in leaps and in bounds and on the other hand Malki also began creating new programs you know after a year she said there was 40 kids and she said i need a program for overnight respite and what she had in mind was a very unique program till this day of every night of the week having a subset of those 40 kids who came in the after school program sleep over so in those days, it was eight kids uh, each night. And what it meant is that if a child slept over on a Monday night, mommy and daddy knew they sent them to schools that the government provided special ed for on Monday morning with a school bus. They didn't see their kid until the following night, Tuesday night. The kid had a blast and we were able to teach him sk skills that mommy may not even have time for or the ability. And what it means is that family now had two days and a night to just get on with their lives. It might be going to a class, it might be putting their feet up and relaxing, whatever it might be, but they suddenly had that mental break. I always said that if there was one of Shalva's many programs that I could have had when I was raising my son, it would have been that one. 
because you just don't get a break. You two were such a good vehicle for this program because you <clears> understood <throat> the value, what it is to you know, have your child be taken care of by someone else, a professional in certain ways, and let them like breathe. Totally, totally. There's a, a very, very a significant academic in Israel. She's 80, 83, 84 today. Her name is Professor Malka Margalit. And Professor Malka Margalit was the head of education at Tel Aviv University. And she's the head of another university today, some program, but she's the Israel Prize winner for education some years ago. And she took a great interest in what we're doing 25 years ago. And we became very friendly. And we sat together one day at a little porch of Shalva after we moved into our own center later. And she said to me basically what you just said. She says, you know, with all my degrees, I could never have done this. I said, Malkin, like, why could you not have done this? She says, because it required a mother who lived in Israel, lived in New York, experienced the gaps in services and had the smarts to know how to fill it in a meaningful way. She says, but there's another reason also, even if I did have the smarts. As a university professor, I would have come to my superiors and said, I have an amazing idea and this and this is the idea. And they said, well, that's very exciting. How are you going to fund it? So, well, I have a foundation that's going to give me the first two years of, of the funds in order to get this off the ground. But the question they would ask is, what will be in year three? Hmm. And if I didn't have an answer, they would say, you're not even going to begin. Your wife had an idiot like you willing <laughs> to do her bidding and run around the world and be the bridge between her dreams and reality. So, you know, it was very funny, but there's truth to what you say. We'll be right back to this week's episode. And, and something very vital in this episode that you'll hear is the care for human life, the care for everyone and anyone. It makes no difference who you are, where you're from, how you look, how you act. We want to help. We want to be good people. And that's exactly why I refuse. I refuse. Absolutely. This is a golden rule that I have for any podcast that I do. I do not partner and I do not take ad from companies or places that I don't believe in. And I I do, I do research the same way I do research on guests, say like that is a good company or that is a good person to have on my show, the same way I do with my ads. So that's exactly why I am so proud to partner with Encore Support. The world of ABA, you've you've definitely heard that term before. I, I've heard it now in the past like two years so so often. So if anyone has a child with autism, it, it could be so complicated and and not easy to navigate. And that's why if you're watching this or listening to this in America and you have Medicaid, you could use Encore support. Um, they're fantastic, fantastic services. They have, I, I, you know, between going to the website and speaking to their people, I haven't gone to their facilities yet, not yet, but they have a lot. So I could go to a bunch of them and uh, maybe I will, but they are people that really care. They really care. They're people and and I say that, that I don't I don't like saying they're a company that cares because that this is just not as human like I say they're people that care because it's that that is the foundation of who they are caring people that really want to help your child but there's more than that you know I think a lot of people watching this whether you're old or young want to get involved so if you have a high school diploma and you want to get into the world of LBA you can they train you in and you could get involved and you could become you know part of their team you don't have to be a you know 100 professional uh ABA to use their services so it's for everyone if you're if you are a professional in the aba services highly recommend go check them out if they not if they they treat their staff as well as they they treat the people that they're caring for so you know it is a family there um i think it's always interesting when a company says we're a family but when an outsider says i see them as a family you could trust them. They're a family. So whether you're a professional in the ABA world or you're Hani and you're 19 years old and you graduated from high school and you're like, I want to get involved. I have no training. They will train you in and you could help with their services. So if you are interested in this, you could give them a call at 718-304-9977 or you could go to their website which is encoresupport.org. You will find the links in the show notes. And, you know, I think I think this is what we're here for. I mean, you'll you'll hear more in this episode with Rabbi Kami and Samuels and the beautiful work Shalva's doing. But 
you know, I, I always feel bad if you're like in Guatemala listening to this. I, I don't think this this particular ad is for you. But, you know, the 98 percent of the people listening to this in America uh, get involved, get involved in in Encore. They are also changing the world and you could also be a part of it. I mean, I think we all know someone in our lives who are on the spectrum and there's these ABA services like Encore that are literally changing not just the lives of the people with autism, but their family as well, which you'll hear this concept, this idea repeated again in this episode. So go ahead and check out Encore. We love them and you'll love them too. Get involved. I have your book over here for those watching. You can see on the screen, I have Dreams Never Dreamed. Um, it, and I, I read probably 75% of the book so far. And don't, Emma, you will spoil the end for me, so it's fine. But um, in it, I one of the, my favorite quotes from it is your wife said, experts built the Titanic and amateurs built Noyach's Teva, Noyach's Ark. It was said with a lot of respect for professionals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't that we don't. We have. We work with phenomenal numbers of professionals, and for they, sure. they run the organization. For but sure. yeah. But she meant to say that there's things parents can do too. Right. It's not always. It's not always that you know you you can't do anything. You, you might be an amateur, but if you know what you want and you have the desire to do it, just go for it. So, but to at a certain point that you're doing this and you're fulfilling your wife's dream. I'm sure it was brutally crushing for you to be like, okay, I'm going to America. I'm going to Canada now to fundraise. No one, no one, no one wants to be a fundraiser. Then they, have, where did you pull the strength for yourself to go out and do it? The first time I did it was a year in. We thought fifty thousand dollars was going to last forever. I mean, right. I thought, it's right, it's, and especially it, back then, that's, it, se- it seemed to me that this was like an astronomical amount of money. But you rent a, a duplex, you pay to a couple of staff, you provide food, whatever it is. A year down the road, we didn't have money, and I was sitting in a situation like, where do I go? So I decided I'm going to fly out to New York, knowing nobody, because when I lived in New York, I was very much homebound focused on my work, focused on my child. I wasn't a social being running around, you know, didn't know anybody. And um, at the airport on my way out, a Hasidish guy that I knew saw me, it was right after Sukkot, and he says to me, Kalman, where are you going? I said, I'm going, why are you going? New York. I told him, I set up this nonprofit for people with disabilities. He says, Kalman, you're crazy. Two thirds of that plane are collectors going to New York. (laughs) So I said, Mendel, I guess I have two options. Either I just take your advice, go home and fold, or I trust in God, get on the plane, and we'll see where it takes me. And, uh, you know, 33, 33 years later, it's gone a distance. Wow, 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 really incredible. So wh- what was, I know in the book you mentioned that there was like entire court case going on because you were pretty yeah. upset at, you know, I guess the people responsible for no. not taking care of them. Yes. Yeah, that, that's also part of the book. Yes. I mean, that's, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, you know, there was a situation when we were in New York that a doctor asked for my child's, um, you know, early uh, milestones from the neurologist that saw him in Israel. And uh, he told me to get it and bring it to him. He knew the doctor and uh, she sent it. And we got it. And when we saw it, the, we saw the whole thing had been doctored up. Things that we knew, he sat up at this age, she had pushed off. It was just not to be believed. Wow. And I said, Malky, this is already, something's going on here, you know, beyond belief. And I said, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. So yeah, I started a crusade to find out what exactly it was. And uh, at the end of the day, we wound up suing the doctor and the you know, the state of Israel, the Ministry of Health, and the, the appropriate, you know, mm-hmm. so whatever. And it was not an easy thing. We were alone in this whole thing. And it took nine years. Wow. And uh, it took, you know, it took our insides out. But at the end of the day, it became very clear that there had been a scandal here and the government had hidden something very, very atrocious. And in Israel, you don't have a jury. There's no emotions. You have a judge, professional judge, like in England or in Canada. And as a result, you know, this guy's a professional. He's got to see it exactly or he's not going to move. There's not going to be some juror who gets excited and says, we got to help this guy. 
And it came to the point where he became convinced that there was a serious problem here. And he told the parties that be that if you'd like to settle, settle. If you don't want to settle, then I am, I'll be free to decide what I want to decide. And they realized that he was going in a direction they didn't want to go. So, you know, at the end of the day, they settled. This wasn't the United States of America. And the settlement enabled me to extricate myself from the debts. Wow. But it didn't, you know, it didn't uh, do what we had hoped it would do. Looking my back, goal do, you my, do you regret it then? No, not at then, all. Because then, hey, paid for the, the bills and for the lawyer, but then again. Yeah, as my father said, you have your victory. He was a lawyer. He says, you have your victory. You know, to say, to, to go on, even if the judge decides in your favor, which it seemed he would, they would absolutely go to the Supreme Court. Mm. Going to the Supreme Court would take another three years, would take out, I knew that I would be handling it all as I handled much of this case, and I would be fighting it. And, you know, my wife said very simply, you know, I have no problem with you going further because I was pushing. She says, give me my divorce, give me my get. Wow. And, and you know, gig is in tight and, and go on with the case. So obviously I realized she was right and we stopped. But the incredible thing was that the this came about a weeks before Shalva was scheduled to open. So someone said to me, like, come and, you know, you're finished with the court case now. Like, what are you going to do? <laughs> and I said, don't worry, I have what to do. Yeah, you you know, I'm, 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 I'm on to something. Else. I'd imagine your time taking care of Shalva and fundraising, as difficult as it is, it's probably so much more enjoyable than having to go through that entire court case. And yeah, no, that was, that was a blip on the radar that we had to do, and we did it. But it wasn't, you know, that was not something that... Uh, we had set out to do or, or you know had any interest in doing so you mentioned before that so you had a daughter and then you had your son yasi and then you had four more boy, four, four, more four, boys, four more boys and then yes 16 and a half years later we were blessed with an additional little daughter how old was your wife at that, that point she 40, was 44 44 i was wow. 47 okay and it was uh you know a new a new life experience you thought like okay we're we're whatever it's 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 a it's a it, surprise it, it was delightful wow and and my fears were you know that at this age it could be a down syndrome right and i was you know i was working with an enormous number of people with disabilities including down syndrome and i used to say hashem you know i really don't need the you know the news that oh did you hear common had also a, a child with down syndrome right and my wife was ready and ready and waiting that if it's down she's going to you know, make this child into whatever, you know, the best she can make, uh, you know, not the best she can make, but she can do everything in her life to to make it happen. So she wasn't the least bit worried. And thank God it was born, you know, she was born a beautiful, healthy little girl. Wow. So your, your wife, and again, this based off the book, your wife seems like an incredibly, and I say this in a positive way, tough person. Like I find so many times in the book, you're like, I can't do it. And she's like, you will do it. And you're like, Okay, I guess we will do it. Like whether it's fundraising and look, it's it's and I, I and it's a good lesson in Shalom bias of like the wife, your wife is always right. I don't know something like that. I had somebody actually. I had dinner with somebody this last week in New York, and she says your book changed my life. I said how so? She was sitting with her husband, and she was a woman of sixty five. She says, I told my husband, why can't you listen to me? Like he listened <laughs> to his wife. I said, look, there's limits for everything. Right. No, Alton Malki is not that way at all. She's, you know, a bright and very clear-sighted person. Mm. And I must give her credit that at many of these junctures, which were challenging and very difficult junctures, she had the clearer vision. And she saw, you know, at, a, at, at an early age, a pediatrician here in New York wanted to give Yossi um, you know, we saw him and he was hyper to the hilt. He was running around at the age of two and a half, three. It was impossible. And he wanted to give him medication that would settle him down. And we walked out with this medication in hand and Malki threw it out. And I said, like, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> she says, I'm not giving this to him. I said, what, what are you doing? And she says, Kalman, you can give this to him today. He's going to settle down, but he's going to remain a sedated little boy who's never going to have the opportunity to be anything of a, an adult that with, with abilities. And I'm going to put up with the challenges and try and channel them into more positive things. And at the end of the day, when Yossi had his breakthrough, I always thought about that moment wow. that had she taken those medications and we had taken an easier route, um, I'm not sure he would ever have gotten to where he got to, where he's just 
driven to succeed and, and driven to make things happen. So, so what is Yossi like today? Yossi is 46 years old. Yossi is the most amazing young man you'll ever, you can meet. He uh, doesn't hear, doesn't see. He's not been able to walk for 23 years. Oh, wow. Uh, we, you know, we sort of struck out twice, once with the unfortunate situation that the vaccine, and I don't compare that vaccine to other vaccines. People, okay, I was going to actually people, ask you about that. People should not misunderstand. People are sometimes surprised that I'm not against vaccines. Right. I said, the vaccine that my child got was medical malpractice right. at, its, at its worst. And it has nothing to do with a typical vaccine that people are coming. The story of vaccines, I let people deliberate however they want, but Kalman Samuels is not a role in that. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, where were we? Uh, Yassi, you said he struck out twice. Yeah, once, you know, the vaccine mm -hmm. that he had. And number two, at the age of about 22, we made him what's called a cochlear implant, which is designed, it's a miracle. When you see children who get it at a young age, they they often hear, you would never know they weren't hearing from, from birth. Right. It's just a, a truly miracle medical, a medical miracle. In his case, uh, after we did the, uh, the procedure, about a month later, Yossi was beginning to walk. And he, as I said, he walked always with a bit of difficulty, but he could walk for miles with us. And he suddenly was afraid to take a step and it got worse. And I went to the professor and I said, doctor, he's losing his balance. He's not, he's not sure of what he's doing and never, this was never there before. So he said, never happened and uh, just never heard of such a, a thing. Uh, more recently, you know, 23 years later, I was at a consultation with three serious heads of the faculty at Hadassah Hospital, and this doctor was long retired. And I shared the the story, and I shared the, uh, um, you know, what his reaction. And she says, "Well, let's judge him favorably. We're not sure what was available to acknowledge at that time, but today we clearly understand that one of the not a it's not rare, and it's not it's rare. I mean, it's not a common thing of any time, but." the impact of the middle ear and the, what goes on with this uh, procedure uh, can cause occasionally problems with balance. So Yossi lost that. It was very hard for him to be in a wheelchair. So he's in a wheelchair, but that doesn't stop him. He is someone who's been hosted by President Bush at the White House. Hmm. He's been hosted by the Prime Minister of England. He is a sommelier. He was trained to be a wine taster. Hmm. He's produced two of his own wines, red, white wow. he has a sense of smell like a bloodhound when the kids were small he had uh, you know if one of them would open up a coke in the next room he would you know say i want one too and uh, someone had suggested that 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 ability could easily be something that he could uh, use for wine tasting so he, he works he works twice a week at a headquarters from the big toll highway route six in Israel. And he puts together three piece easy passes and he puts together a large number. And they always laugh and they say that he doesn't use, he has an iPhone and he's in constant contact with people through whoever's with him. But, you know, through texts and through emails, what have you. And on the phone, you know, someone will call him and speak, tell the person who's with him what he wants to say. And he also will take the phone and go back to a monologue. Um, but he, 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 he works as well. He rides horses. Hmm. Um, he travels widely. He was in London two weeks, two months ago with two friends, and he's been in London a number of times. Uh, this next Sunday, a week from tomorrow, he's off to Dubai. Wow! With with friends, uh, he's an amazing, amazing young man, full of life. And if anyone meets him, you know it's just an extraordinary. He'll meet you today. He'll talk to you about things. He he's involved with politics. He's involved with anything you want. And if he meets you and has a meaningful discussion with you, when you meet him ten years later, he'll continue from the point that discussion wow. was left. We'll be right back to this week's episode. But first, if you're watching or listening to this, it means one thing: a hundred percent, one hundred percent. Every single person watching or listening to this has listened to a podcast. I mean, even if this is your first one, you listen to podcasts. That's why I am. More than proud to tell you about one of my favorite podcasts, the Unrestricted Podcast. Get this. Imagine the one of the former CEOs of the OU, the, I don't know if it's the largest, but definitely one of the largest Jewish organizations in the world, in the history of the world. Steve Savitsky is a former CEO of it, and he's he 
he's done a lot. He's done a lot. He's made a big impact and he's not finished. He's having conversations with different people, different leaders, different big players in organizations or just big companies that have done so much for the world, but now they're retired. So it's this beautiful idea where the, the gloves are off. They could really finally, all those questions that you really want to ask that everyone's so politically correct not to say the wrong thing about because listen, I, at the end of the day, I am here in this position. He gets them with gloves off and they have a really nice, honest, raw conversation. I think one of the the magic components of making a good podcast is to be able to have a realistic conversation. Whenever someone's wearing some form of a mask, I don't even mean a physical mask. I mean, a physical mask also probably would not help, but that's when the conversations aren't as good. But Steve does a great job at disarming and just making the people feel comfortable and having just a good conversation about their experiences. I mean, if you haven't yet listened, go ahead. There's currently three episodes out. Find them on Spotify or Times of Israel. You'll see a link in our show notes, but you could listen to his conversation with Amos Yadlin. And by the way, I'm going to butcher their names um, because not all of them are from America. Richard Joel, pretty sure I, I pronounced that right. And uh, Michal Cutler. So th they're great. Um, I, I think you'll, depending who you are, you will like a different episode. I'm not going to tell you listen to episode one because you might be an episode three person. You might be episode two person or episode one person. Different strokes like different episodes. So go ahead, check them all out. I, I say listen on like 2x speed at first to get a sense of like which episode you want to hear. But I have a small feeling you're going to enjoy all the episodes. It's great. I love it. Um, I mentioned it before, Steve appeared on one of our episodes. Two people emailed me and got it right. So go ahead and uh, listen to the Unrestricted Podcast. You won't regret it. Now back to this week's episode. Did he ever like show like, I guess, I don't say resentment, but like just anger towards the predicament that he got treated and that he's in? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. He's, he's a very bright young man. And uh, he's very hurt and angry that the, you know, the, the Ministry of Health uh, allowed this to happen and allowed him to be injured by something like that. It was, you know, you mentioned the book. One of the reasons for the book is Yossi's ongoing request for me to please write his story. People should know that I wasn't born like this. Mm. I was born healthy and someone injured me. So yes, Yossi is very, very aware of it. Yossi is a religious kid in the depths of his soul. He doesn't have the trimmings anymore. You know, he's not growing up with, he's, he's blind, he's deaf. He's not wearing a suit and he's not wearing a black hat. He is deeply religious in ways that it's hard to understand. When he, when he prays every morning with his fill, he doesn't go to shul. He's very hard to get him there. He dabbles on at home and, you know, he uh, puts on his film. And he says, Shema Yisrael, and he starts davening for people who are ill, people who need a shidduch, whatever it might be. I, it, there's a story in the book where someone couldn't have children for eight years, and they asked him to daven for them, and, yeah, and it's, they had a baby and few children. Well, when the guy visited after he was in the States, and he came back to visit to share the news with me, Erev Pesach, that uh, he was going to tell me that, that his wife is expecting, you know, the, the miracle, and... Um, he came to my house. I says, come, can I visit you? I said, sure, come over. So he came over and he was very excited. And he says, I have something. You're not going to believe something I have to tell you. And I say, yeah, I know. He says, what do you mean you know? He says, Yossi told me. Told me what? That Sarah's pregnant. He fell off, fell off his chair. Yossi davened for him for many months, very, very seriously. And then we noticed he had stopped davening for him and his wife. And we asked, like, why are you davening for Sarah? She says she's she's expecting. So, you know, we sort of said, okay. So when he came over, we said, that's it. Wow. So, you know, this is, but, you know, I, I want to say something. I think people, parents and people with disabilities and kids have a great challenge. We all have them. And there's a temptation to go off in directions of very spiritual directions. And I understand it. And, you know, I, I can't say I wasn't there. But I think people have to really try very hard to keep their feet on the ground and recognize that there's no question these are special neshamas, but between that and assigning to them, you know, great messaging and great shlichut and all these things, I've seen a lot of that. It's been brought to my attention many times personally, and I, I really urge people to avoid it and just know that 
Hashem in His goodness gave us a child with a disability. He gave us a challenge. We'll never understand why, but if we really believe in Hashem and trust in Hashem, then we just accept it with love and do everything we can to make that neshama have the best world they can have. But, you know, it's, it's I think, really is a something important to keep your feet on the ground. Can I tell you a little bit more about Shalva? Yeah, yes. I was going to ask you, like, where's Shalva today? Like, tell let, us let me, let me just ask you the process. In 2005, the government came to me. Uh, we built our own center in the 90s, a beautiful center. And we had 400 kids. And the programs didn't stop with an after-school program. It went overnight. And it went uh, with a program that my wife, I came home from work one day from my computer work. Uh, and I found my wife crying at 4.30 in the afternoon. And I said, what do I do now? <laughs> and she says, for a change, nothing. And I said, so why are you crying? And she began to say that I know I can help mothers in a real way and I'm not doing it. And I said, what She's is- She's not what? doing enough. <laughs> right. And she at this time had, you know, programs running from one in the afternoon till with the overnight till eight the next morning. And Shalva has always been immaculate. I mean, she was like, it has to be immaculate beyond immaculate so that parents, children, staff feel that they have worth and they have value and somebody cares and wants them to have a quality of life. And it's always been that way. So she described a program that she wanted to call Me and My Mommy, which was a program for new mothers who just gave birth to a child with a disability, whether they knew about it up front or they didn't know, it doesn't make a difference. Mommy's blown out of the water when it happens. And uh, everyone else's child is moving forward in her family. Her child is very struggling. And Malky says, I remember too clearly the horrific loneliness that comes with it. And she said, doctors and social workers are great, but they're not going to be able to help that mother. That's not their role. The only group that can help that mother are other mothers. She has to have a community where she comes in contact with others in similar situations, has coffee and cake. She says, I want a program where every day of the week, a different group of mothers comes in each day of the week. And the day that they're there for five hours, they have five different therapies, you know, physio, speech, swimming in our pool with other mothers and a therapist with their babies and having coffee and cake with other mothers. And she says, that will put mommy back on her feet. And if mommy gets back on her feet, then all the therapy do will have value because the family will also function. So I said to her, you know, at this time, Shalva's costing a million dollars a year. Wow. And I'm working still. I don't you know, where am I going to take that money from? Who's going to, I said, who's going to pay for that? She says, you. <laughs> and I said, and where am I going to get that money? She says, come and get it through your head. There is no shortage of money in the world. There's only a shortage of health. You'll go another week and God will help. You'll find it. And when she said it, it was, believe me, more than strange. You know, like, really? <laughs> but over the years, I recognized how right she is. There's money there. There's wealth there. It may not be that people are spending it on kids with disabilities, but it's there. And you just need siyata deshma. You need the help from above to make it happen. So in 2005, the government came to me and said, we have a, a we want to, we have a very big piece of land and we would like to give it to you if you are prepared to build it and take in many more children. And when we saw the land, it was, you know, something ridiculous. It was six acres in the heart of Jerusalem, right next to the Sharet Sedek Medical Center. And um, it was a very difficult piece of land. There was a mountain of rubble on it. But we said, let's go for it. And we did. We didn't never believe they'd actually give it to us. They did. And we uh, began a process of building something without money, not knowing where we were going to take the money. But our feeling was it wasn't a crime to try. It would be a terrible crime to, it was not a crime to fail. It would be a terrible crime not to try and make the effort because we realized such an opportunity will never, ever happen again. Right. So um, we did and we started and it took 10 years, but we built the largest center in the world for people with disabilities. It's magnificent. It's 220,000 square feet, 12 stories with a fully, you know, a semi-Olympic pool indoors, a huge therapy and pool indoors, a 350 seat magnificent auditorium, a full-size gym and beautiful art. You walk into a three-story atrium. And as one guy said to me when he walked in many years ago, he says, Kalman, all this for who? I said, Jack, 
let's have a tour and then I'll sit down with you and have a cup of coffee. We have a beautiful cafe at the center. And we had our tour and we sat down for coffee and he didn't even remember his question. <laughs> but I said, Jack, I've been in your community and it's in Long Island, but it's way, it's old Westbury, you know, way yeah. far out, yeah, yeah. very wealthy community. I said, Jack, I've been to your community center. And if I'm not mistaken, you guys have semi Olympic pool, a gym, an auditorium, just like we do. He says, for sure. He says, Jack, why do you guys invest in all these things? He says, come and it's called quality of life. I said, Jack, who told you that because a mother gave birth to a baby with disability, in your book, not only she has to cope with the disability, but she has to forfeit the claim to quality of life. The building's here, Jack, to tell you and others like you that we're going to give this mother quality of life because she's worthy of that quality of life. He got the message. <laughs> That's really incredible. Do you ever like look at like, um, and again, anyone who sees the book, like sees the, or have been in there to to see it, like the gorgeous campus. Do you like look at it in disbelief? Like how in the world did we actually build this? Like it's. Sometimes people say you must be so proud. I said, well, actually it doesn't really enter into the equation every day. And this is going on for, we're, th we're there now for seven years. Every day when I walk in, I say to myself, I'm like, who the heck built this? What is this? It's just, it was a $70 million project and the government gave me 10 million. So 60 million had to be raised from the private sector. These were amounts that I had never dealt with, nor did I ever dream of these kinds of amounts. But it's built. Today we have a $23 million budget. The government gives me about 40% of my budget. And there's a, a gap between what we get from different sources that has to be raised of $7 million. So it's a huge number to have to raise every year. And we're always working with the government, hoping to get a little bit more from them. Uh, but it goes on. So during COVID, I didn't travel. But, uh, you know, so to speak, 71 years old, and I'm back, boots on the ground. And I'm not alone. <laughs> we have 550 employees. Wow. We have, you know, 1,000 kids a day, 2,000 kids a week going through our programs. We have, me and my mommy, we have daycare. We have preschools. We have programs for adults. We have uh, vocational training. We have 10 apartments in the community, inclusive living with six young men or six young women in those communities. Uh, during COVID, we learned to work with Zoom and uh, we learned to do therapy with Zoom. You know, it was just everyone learned how to do things. And we created what's called the Shalva Institute, where we don't, you know, pretend that we are a university giving out degrees, but we share everything we've always done. We've always done this, but now it's more formal. And we share everything that shall, we call it the Shalva way. People have a great interest worldwide. How do you do the me and my mommy? How do you do the overnight respite? How do you do this? How do you do that? And we are now building it, launching it. We've launched it. And we're now helping people in the Emirates, in Dubai, in uh, Bahrain, in Africa, several African countries, whether it's Kenya, Ethiopia, even a very poor country called Mozambique, South America, Europe, the Far East. It's, you know, the one of the projects we had independent of all this is something called the Shalva Band. I was going to say, I was going to say, tell me about Eurovision, which is a question I never asked any of my guests. I'm sure not, <laughs> you know. Uh, so... Yeah, tell us into, about the Shalva Band. In, in, we always had music, day one. Mm -hmm. We had a music therapist. Everyone knows that music is a wonderful thing for anybody, especially with kids with disabilities. And we always had it. And then we had a program with the kids, you know, sort of an in-house little activity, and they would play for different things in-house. And then we, 2005, we actually decided we're going to create a Shalva Band. And it was all with doing in-house things. It wasn't about going elsewhere, but it grew. And then it went to playing in sort of activities. Sometimes there was things for, for uh, bands with kids with disabilities, and they played in those settings. And then they got to the point where they were very, very excellent. And they toured the States, and they were in Russia, and uh, Moscow, and England, and Mexico, Canada, you know, New York. And um, they were picked up by Israel's version of America Has Talent. And they asked them to come audition and they auditioned and they were accepted immediately and they entered this competition. The winner of this television show represents Israel in Eurovision. A lot of Americans don't know what that is, but it's the largest musical show in the world. And it's 42 European countries with Australia, it's with Israel. And uh, there's 200 million viewers. So there's a semi-final and there's a final on Eurovision. And... Uh, 
to right when the band went right through the Israeli program, they won, knocked out the competition, and they got to the final four. When they got to the final four, we learned from the Eurovision people and the television show that they not only would have to play on, if they won, not only have to play on Motzei Shabbat on Saturday night, they would have to perform a rehe- dress rehearsal on Friday night. No amount of effort by ministers and everybody was able to change the schedule. And the, we had a choice of what to do. So four of the band members were religious. Four of the band members were not. We came from families that weren't religious. We service everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, we have enormous number of religious people because that's the community we serve. But we take have always taken first come, first serve. And, you know, it's it's a great Kiddush Hashem that we serve the the world anybody who needs our services so they came to a decision and of course it was very you know it was our our view as well and they said we came in as a family and we left as a family when they left the show we did not say it's about shabbos i was pushed from all sides tell him it's shabbos i said let us handle it our way to clarify they didn't they didn't do it the show because they did not do the show and we we we, but when we left the show Mm -hmm. and we and it was this was headline news in israel for two weeks is the shalva band they were like the most popular thing in israel Mm -hmm. is the shalva band leaving the show are they staying in the show what's going to be and when we left because of that we said we respectfully withdraw for reasons beyond our control we allowed the, the concept of Shabbat, Shabbos, to be talked about by others. This was huge news in Israel and elsewhere that, wow, these people actually have principles. They stated their principles. They left because of Shabbat, but they did it in a way, in a positive note, without saying, you know, we do it this way and you guys don't. And it was just a very, very powerful thing. If you, I mean, you Google it, it's, it's all over the place in Hebrew and in English. Uh, so the Eurovision was very impressed. And they turned to the television station and said, we would like them to be guest artists at the semifinals, which also has 200 million viewers. <laughs> so on Thursday night, they played and they sang a song called A Million Dreams from a show called The, uh, a movie, the, the Greatest, Great, the greatest Showman. Yeah. And Shalom Lemmer. Shalom Lemmer yeah. sang it. Yeah, we, 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 we beat him by four years. Okay. So in 2019, <laughs> they wow. sang that on Eurovision. And he sings it magnificently. Yeah, yeah, sure. But you should listen to their version. And I did. Uh, I was crying the whole time. So I watched it. So and the talkbacks, the BBC tweeted ten minutes after they finished it. This is what Eurovision is designed for. This would have been the winning act had they been able to compete. And that tweet went viral. You know, there was a million, a million tweet, a million viewers in the next eight, ten hours, wow. and all over Europe. It was newspapers, you know, what, a guy in Helsinki was asking a guy in uh, Czechoslovakia on the talkbacks and these articles, he says, what is this business of, of Sabbath? What do they do that they can't play? Hmm. So the guy in Czechoslovakia writes him back, well, they don't do electricity. So from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, you know, they don't use electricity. So, that, and the Shalva band continues till this day. They're, they're adults, they're professionals, and they're performing during COVID. They even performed many places online. The World Health Organization has used them as, as presenters of one of their global health programs. They're playing for the United Nations in Geneva in May. They'll be making another American tour in the summer. It's, it's an amazing thing, but they really changed the way the world looks at disabilities. And they put the name Shalva Band out there in a way that is, you know, hard to imagine. We'll be right back to this week's episode and stick around one of the most beautiful moments ever in Inspiration for the Nation history happened. So listen to the full thing, folks. But first, I need to tell you about the revolution Simcha time. Okay, there was someone named Simcha Belsky of Shalom in the five towns that he was someone that stood for Chesed. It doesn't make a difference who you are or what time of day it was. If you needed help, that's who Simcha was. That's what he did. And we want to remember him and 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 have his neshama have an aliyah by saying, let's all be more like Simcha. So his family is came out with this beautiful idea called Simcha time. Simcha time essentially is this idea where you're going to go out of your way this week to do a chesed. Yes, we all do chesed because we want to feel good or it's convenient. Go a little out of your way this week by doing a, sim, a Simcha time, doing a chesed and saying, you know what, this is inconvenient, but I'm going to help another person out and go ahead and do it. But don't stop there. On Shabbos, you put down your spoons to your soup and you say, I could do it at any point in the meal. And you say, okay, guys and girls, we're going to do Simcha time. We're going to go around the table. 
let's hear about those moments. I guarantee you, money back guarantee, you don't have to pay for this, but money back guarantee that you will have a transformation in your shop and transformation in your entire week where everyone's gonna go around and say the time in the week where they went out of their way to help someone else out. It will give you life. There was so many people going through life with like, why are they here? What's this is it's such a fulfilling moment. So go ahead and circle around the table and say, what was your simcha time? But I want to dig deeper. I want to say the incredible simcha time that happened that got this episode out. And I am so thankful for it. The person on this episode, Rabbi Kalman Samuel, was sitting on a plane with this this fellow named Troy. He's a, a, a nice uh, a black fellow who has his own skincare company. Um, and they just had a conversation. Whenever we go on planes, I know me. I put my hood on, put my earbuds in. I don't want to talk to anyone. I'm going to be tired when I get to wherever I'm going. And I will not have energy. Usually didn't sleep the night before. And I don't. I just shut everything out. But what a Kiddush Hashem we could do by sitting next to someone and showing them, I mean, if you're Jewish, if you're not Jewish, like showing them, hey, I'm a nice, kind human and I want to hear about your life. Let's have a conversation. That's exactly what Common Samuels did. That's exactly what Troy did. They made this unbelievable bond. Now, Troy and, and of course, humans of Judaism um, shared that that picture that Troy shared. Um, Troy shared on his LinkedIn, humans of Judaism shared it to a quarter million, probably more the followers. So uh, go ahead and follow humans of Judaism. We love them here. Um, but because of that, because of Troy, because of uh, uh, Rabbi Samuels, they just together, they went ahead and just had this conversation. That's why this episode happened. So you never know what's going to come from your simple time. That's not the reason to do it. That's not the reason to do the chesed. I say do it because you're going to feel good about yourself. Also do it because someone's going to benefit from it. But also down the line, you never know where it's going to lead you. So go ahead and do simple time. Now, back to this week's episode. So before we, we wrap up, because we, we have to go soon, uh, what's advice you'd give to either a parent of of a child with disabilities or or just anyone going through a struggle in, in life? What's What would your advice be for them? You know, I would say a word in Hebrew, katonti, you know, I'm too small to be able to give advice of that nature. Um, I really don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. I I just know that at some point, it's, it's really so often a question of our own personal trust in God. And I deal with a lot of people who are not religious and, you know, we have different discussions on, on that level, but it's a matter of just persevering. We put into Yossi everything we had for years and we saw nothing in return. You know, we, he was a cute kid and we did everything we could, et cetera, et cetera. But when he had his breakthrough, everyone said to us, his breakthrough didn't happen in a vacuum. His breakthrough happened because you as parents were pushing the limits for all the years. And when it happened, he had somehow the the tools with which to break through. So, you know, we don't take credit for that. But the fact of the matter is that I can only tell parents that do everything you can. And I would, yes, give advice. Be aware that when there's a child with a disability in the family, the siblings, spoken or unspoken, recognize that he's top priority and it has to be that way you know his needs are always going to be met first and you know it's very important to recognize that your other children need you and at times when you're able make sure that they know above and beyond your love for them and your care and because uh, i've seen too many situations where you know siblings wind up having a problem later. And the other thing I can say, if you're a parent of a child with disabilities, and this is what I say to first time parents, we have a lot of support groups and I, once a year I give it to the, the new parents of, of children. And I found it that it's very moving to them is that be a proud parent, whether you, whatever, however you're going to do that, but your siblings, your children are watching. And if you're in any way embarrassed, if you're turning your head when you're in public with your child with his disability, believe me, the damage is being done to your other children. And they're going to grow up without the confidence they need in life. And if, on the other hand, you are a proud parent, and wherever you are, you are proud of who you are and your child, and he's just one like anybody else. So his needs are special. Everyone has needs. Someone has an IQ of 180. One has an IQ of 90. I mean, it's like everyone's different. But if you're a proud parent, that will be seen. That will be 
internalized by your children and they have every chance of growing up to be balanced adults and go on and live a life of their own in the way you'd like it. But I can't overstate how important that is that I always say to parents, if you think your problem is this child, you're very wrong. This child, you're going to do the best you can with. And of course, it's a, it's a challenge, but you've got to be very careful not to oversee another challenge that could develop if you don't deal with this head on, however you want to do that. But just be so very proud of who you are and who your child is. That's really beautiful. Okay. My last question for you is, could you give us a story that inspires you? It could involve Yossi. It could be, it could be something that happened at Shalva. Yeah, I'd love to. Okay. I'd love to finish with one. Yeah. Yossi always dreamed of riding an elephant. And uh, we didn't know how to make that happen because the natural place from Israel to ride an elephant is Kenya. Kenya requires a whole slew of vaccinations. You know, we played Russian roulette and lost up to one. <laughs> we weren't about to, when it wasn't needed, right. start going to make a lot of vaccinations to ride an elephant. And Malki received an email one day from a young man that had worked with Yossi. And he says, Malki, I'm in, Ken I'm in uh, Thailand. There are elephants. Vaccines aren't needed. I'm here for three more weeks. Send me Yossi immediately. <laughs> now, the two of them got another good friend, 25-year-old guy that had worked with Yossi and loved Yossi. And uh, he said, I'm going to do it. So he went out to Thailand with Yossi, which is quite an undertaking when he can't walk. And um, this, about two days later, I was hosting in, in the old, the earlier center that we had, I was hosting four American congressmen and uh, they were visiting Shalva. And I said to my secretary, I said, you know, do me a favor. Let me just sit in the guest room and give them a 20 minute overview. I'll take them on a visit, but don't let anybody bother me in the meantime. Didn't go by two minutes. There was a knock at the door. I opened the door. It's her. And she's very emotional. And she says, for God's sakes, look at your email. I had no idea what this was about. And I looked at the email, I excused myself, looked at the email and I uh, broke out crying. Yossi was on that elephant with his two friends and he was smiling from ear to ear. And I said to the congressman, gentlemen, I gave them a little bit of background. I said, gentlemen, Yossi's a guy that never stops dreaming. He's got no reason to dream. He can't get out of bed in the morning himself. He can't walk, can't see, can't hear. And yet he's forever dreaming. And incredibly, God is helping him realize amazing, amazing dreams. I says, as I get older, and I'm sure it's true with you, we sort of slow down and we're sort of dreaming less. And I think that if there's a lesson to be learned from Yossi, it's doesn't matter what stage of life you are. If you're young, if you're middle, if you're a little bit older, keep dreaming. I always tell young people, you're going to become my age, 71, God willing, and much more. And you're going to be looking back at life. And someone's going to ask you, did you live a life of dreams? And he's, yeah, yeah, of course I lived a life of dreams. Were they your dreams? Well, re not really. I wanted to be one thing and somebody else wanted me to be something else. And I was that something else. I said, don't go there. Whatever your passion is, you're entitled. Don't let anybody get between you and your passion and your dreams. And then God willing, you'll live a life of meaning that'll bring you a lot of joy. All right, Kalman Samuels, thank you so much. Thank you, Yaakov. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. And it just blows my mind that I got a call from like it was really a text from the head of humans of Judaism. And they're like, I, I don't know if the person wants me to say who they are, but they said, you have to, I have a perfect, incredible person for you. And at that point, obviously I saw the the LinkedIn post who, who hasn't seen it. I mean, humans, humans of Judaism did such a good job of showing the world how beautiful uh, Troy and Ravi Samuel's conversation was, but it's, it's just incredible. And, and I connected with Ravi Samuel's and I'm like, I always know within the first five seconds if I want to interview someone, and it was it was like clear, push it. Um, he sent me his book, which is very nice, and I read it. I just like my wife's like, "Are you okay?" And I'm like, "I'm more than okay. I'm just bawling my eyes out, chapter after chapter, just reading about their story so in depth. I highly recommend you you go and and read it. And I'm not even the reader type to be honest, but um. There's so much more nuance. And even while Robbie Samuels is talking, he's like, and this woman helped our son like discover that he could, you know, communicate. I'm like, oh, sh like in my brain, I'm like, Shana, but I don't want to interrupt him. Um, so go ahead and, and I highly recommend to purchase the book. The link in the, is in the show notes and the link for all our sponsors in the show notes. Go ahead and support them. The more you support our sponsors, the more we get to do this stuff. So 
listen to the incredible podcast go out and be a part of the incredible encore encore world whether you're an aba specialist or you're someone with a high school diploma wants to get involved in lba and also simcha time i don't care who you are or where you are you could be a part of the simcha time revolution uh an exciting new announcement we have a incredible newsletter every single week Shem that will we're, we're taking the best moments from twitter the music world the world of just being a jew and we're making a newsletter i've been personally for my career making newsletters since 2017 so this has passion project really wanted to get out there and with the incredible help of yohades we're putting out really really incredible content each week in the newsletter a nice roundup so go ahead and check that out Go ahead and follow our friends at Humans of Judaism. They're incredible. This episode would not have happened without them. And they uh, making like the world's biggest Kiddush Hashem. So go ahead and check them out. We love what they're doing on all platforms. They're basically everywhere. And um, this is this is a, a story that that uh, I really hope touched touched you the way it touched me. And if you could uh, donate to Shalva. Again, the rabbi does not know I'm doing this. He'll probably be embarrassed if you knew, but I don't care. Uh, go ahead and donate to Shalva. I'm, if you're ever in Israel, go check out their facility. I definitely will the next time I'm there. What they're doing is literally changing the world. So go ahead and um, give a donation to them because they could use it. I can't even imagine what it's like to like, I don't know, I think they've like raised like $90 million a year. It's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, I'm living in Chaim's organization. I'm like trying to think like how I'm going to raise like hundred thousand dollars and i'm like bugging out so i can't even i can't even fathom it but uh the work that they're doing is it's incredible and um i i think this is a story for for everyone and anyone i i, I think we we often put like buckets like oh we're talking to someone with like uh, someone with a disability so send this episode to someone with a disability no 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 this is an episode for everyone and anyone because we all have our struggles and 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 it comes in different forms and in and, and different people but this is just i don't know i i feel so relatable and, and i personally got a lot of chizik if these episodes are giving me you know different episodes give different people chizik this episode gave me a lot of chizik so again thank you um to the samuels family i know we we only had one person from it but for all of them the the mrs samuels and and yassi and and the brothers and the sister like all of you guys um keep up the awesome work that you're doing Go ahead and rate us five stars if you haven't. If you got this far on the YouTube video, go ahead and comment the words heartwarming. That's it, the word heartwar heartwarming on YouTube. Go ahead and leave it there. Don't forget, you could always find inspiration in your life. L'chaim. Living L'chaim.